Okay, so on to the next slide. I have a series of vocabulary questions. You can get the answers either from the last video where I gave you two of them, or you can get them from the textbook. I do want to call your attention to the chapter. This is chapter 13. For the first week of our class, you need to read chapter 13.1 through 13.4. Uh, and that's introducing you to intermolecular forces and connecting with what we just learned uh, at the very end of Chem 1. Um, the homogeneous question down here is because the words solution and homogeneous are actually synonyms. They mean exactly the same thing. So we didn't use this phrase in the beginning of Chemistry 1, probably. Um, but it turns out when we learned about homoge homogeneous or homogeneous solutions, um, you were actually learning about solutions, all solutions, OK? Um, so I want you to write those definitions down. What you're going to do with your notes is you're going to actually take photos of them. And I will show you how to do that. You can take a look at the tech tips video for that information. Um, but you're going to take photos, um, turn it into a PDF, and upload them for, for some points. That's how I'm encouraging you to make sure that you're actually taking notes. All right, so have you ever wondered why some things mix and other things don't? Um, when I was in grad school, when I was getting, making the decision about which grad school I wanted to go to, one of the places that I got accepted to um, flew me to uh, Eastern Washington State. And one of the evenings they had a mixer at a bar which they paid for, which is great. So if you're ever considering going to graduate school, just a note, chemists get paid to go. We don't pay for it because um, you're paid for teaching and you're paid for research. And also they have some pretty cool um, recruitment weekends. So keep that in mind as you go through your education. Anyway, so I first encountered these kind of shots. I don't drink a lot, so I hadn't had a lot of exposure to these kind of things. Again, I was, I'm broke in college, right? So I go to this mixer and they have these shots that aren't mixing, which is kind of ironic to me. And I was looking at them, curious, why don't they mix? I know it's alcohol and water, probably some flavor coloring, because I can see that. But why aren't they mixing? I thought, you know, normally when I mix a yellow thing and a blue thing, they turn green. But that's not what I was seeing. And so my question is, why, why do you think this shot is separated. How would you do that if you were trying to make something pretty um, separate solutions? We called that heterogeneous mixtures in Chem 1. Um, so in terms of techno technically speaking, we would call this mixing process on the left, we'd call that a spontaneous homogeneous solution, meaning it mixes without me having to do anything. Um, even if you stir it, that still counts as spontaneous. So when a scientist uses the word spontaneous, they actually mean that it is possible to happen at all in any conditions. They don't mean that it happens quickly. They don't mean that it's an impulsive decision. It just means that it can happen at all. So that word is going to keep coming up throughout the semester. Um, so just remember, when we say that something is spontaneous, it means it can happen. OK? Um, so why? Is the one on the left spontaneous and the one on the right is not? This is confusing. The answer lies in thinking about intermolecular forces. Okay, When two things have similar intermolecular forces, they will mix. So what we can conclude from this picture is that these two substances have similar intermolecular forces. In order for something to form a heterogeneous mixture, they must have very different um, polarities, right? So you might be familiar with this um, in terms of the phrase that like oil and water, right? So if you take a look at Italian dressing, which is made out of vinegar, which is essentially water um, with some acetic acid and some oil, they don't mix together. You have to shake it up right before you put it on your salad or else it's not going to taste very good. Um, that's because Oils are hydrocarbons. And if you recall from the last video, hydrocarbons are nonpolar. Water, of course, is very polar, which means the two things don't mix. They have very different IMF. So one way that you could make something like this drink is if you had one that's an oil and one that's a water-based solution. It might not taste great, um, but you could. 
the way this is actually made, I believe, is by having a very dense sugar solution on the bottom. So it has tendency to sink. And if you pour the water on top really slowly, the, this is actually the alcohol layer, but it's, it's mostly water. Um, if you pour that on there slowly, it won't mix very well because the syrup is already saturated with sugar. That means that the water molecules have surrounded and are interacting with the sugar uh, as much as they can. They're like occupied. And so fitting in more alcohol is difficult. All right. Um, if you mix these together, they will turn green. But if you let it sit for a while, it will separate again. That means it's a heterogeneous solution. So by definition, homogeneous solutions need to have um, stability. If you leave it sitting there and it separates again, then it was never actually homogeneous, even if it looked like it. OK. You can also create distinct layers by using different temperatures. Um, I already said different densities. That's what the sugar does. You can use different types of materials, polar and nonpolar things. So there's quite a few ways that you can achieve layers like this. The ocean does it by having different temperatures um, and different densities. There's some places in the ocean that are really interesting because they, they have kind of currents that cross each other or go on top of each other, and they have different temperatures and different life lives in those areas, depending on the conditions. So there are four types of intermolecular forces. You can read about the details in your textbook, but in order of lowest energy to highest energy, we have, we have something that we call London dispersion forces, or LDF is the abbreviation that we frequently use. So that's the lowest energy thing. Everybody has London dispersion forces. Every single molecule has that, even the nonpolar ones. Um, in fact, nonpolar things only have London dispersion forces, which means they have a relatively low IMF energy. The next highest is something we call dipole-dipole. That means you have two permanent dipoles, and they're going to orient so that the negative part is against the positive part. The next highest in energy is called hydrogen bonds. Now, this is very confusing for students because the word bond is in here, but I really, really want to emphasize it is not a bond, all right? These are very, very weak forces, maybe 5 to 10 kilojoules, maybe as high as 20 kilojoules if it's really, really strong per mole. And bonds are like hundreds of kilojoules per mole. So clearly, hydrogen bond is a misnomer. It is wrong. Uh, we should probably call it hydrogen intermolecular force or something, but this was discovered by biologists before we had really, really good um, molecular level imaging technologies. And it's really hard to get names changed, as it turns out. So that word remains. Don't confuse it. It is not a bond. It is not that strong. We have definitions um, for how much energy is needed for these things. And all four of these categories of IMF are far, far too weak to be considered a bond. I know it's confusing, but we call it a hydrogen bond anyway. Our next and last IMF, our strongest one, is ion-dipole interactions. This just means this is why ionic things dissolve in water, because water has a dipole. It's polar, so it has a dipole. And ionic things break into ions. So when we dissolve salt, for example, your sodium ions get surrounded. We call this hydrated because it's water. You could, If it's not water, you can call it solvated. That's another good word to know. So we've solvated the sodium ion because the waters are pointing so that the negative part, so this whole thing is positive, the negative part of each water is oriented towards the sodium like this. That's a really, really stable interaction. And it means you can dissolve a lot of sodium chloride in water. The chlorine, of course, has the same thing happens. But instead of the negative side, it's going to have the positive side pointing towards it because chlorine is negative. So that's the magic of intermolecular forces. It tells you when things are going to dissolve. It tells you when things are going to be solids, liquids, and gases. The higher the force, the higher the energy, the more likely something is to be a solid. A lot of hydrocarbons, for example, pentane, butane, uh, have, have, are more likely to be liquids. Um, 
methane is one carbon. It's very light. It's a hydrocarbon, one carbon, four hydrogens. It is a gas. It's called natural gas, as a matter of fact. Um, so that means it has weak IMF. You should know these. You should know relatively how they rank with each other. And you should understand that if this was to scale and we wanted to put covalent or ionic bonds on there, it would be way off the edge of the computer screen. Like it would be in, it would be in my yard somewhere. Okay. So IMF are very weak compared to bonds. And when you're comparing IMF, the weakest is dispersion forces and the strongest is ion dipole. 